Uh, for many years, both of you have been warning about the dangers of derivatives, uh, at one point calling them financial weapons of mass destruction. Uh, yet every year, tens of trillions of dollars of derivatives are, are bought and sold. Uh, it just seems to be getting bigger and bigger and almost uh, certainly improperly accounted for. And so I was wondering if you could comment uh, in, in specifically if you have any thoughts on how much longer this might go on. Do you see anything imminent uh, that could uh, derail this ever-inflating bubble? Uh, what might trigger it? And uh, who should be doing what to try and mitigate uh, this looming danger? Well, we've tried to do a little to mitigate it ourselves by talking about it. But the uh, you're right that — and it isn't the derivative itself. I mean, there's nothing evil about a derivative instrument. As I mentioned, we, we have 60-some of them at, at Berkshire. And on Monday, I will go over the directors — with the directors, I'll go over all 60-some. And believe me, we'll make money out of those particular instruments. Uh, but the — the usage of them on an expanding basis, more and more imaginative ways of using them, introduces essentially more and more leverage uh, into the system. And it's an invisible or largely invisible sort of leverage. Now, if you go back to the 1920s, uh, after the crash, the United States government held hearings. They decided that leverage margin in those days, as they call it, leverage contributed to perhaps the crash itself and certainly to the extent of the crash. And it was like pouring gasoline on a fire was when uh, people's holdings got tripped. You know, when stocks went down 10 percent, people had to sell, and another 10 percent more people had to sell, and so on. So, Leverage was regarded as dangerous, and the federal and the United States government empowered the Federal Reserve to regulate margin requirements, regulate leverage, and that was taken very seriously. And for decades, it was a a source of real attention. I mean, if you went to a bank and tried to borrow money on a stock, they made you sign certain papers as to that you weren't in violation of the margin requirements, and they policed it. And it was taken quite seriously when the Fed increased or decreased margin requirements. It was a signal of how they felt about the level of speculation. Well, the introduction of, of um, derivatives uh, and index future, all that sort of thing, uh, has just totally made any regulation of margin requirements uh, a joke. They still exist, and the, the, you know, it's it's a, it's an anachronism. Um, so. I believe, I think Charlie probably agrees with me, that we may not know where exactly the danger begins and where — and at what point it becomes a super danger and so on. We certainly don't know what will end it precisely. We don't know when it will end precisely. But we probably, at least I believe, that it will go on and increase to the point where at some point uh, — There'll be some very unpleasant things happen in markets because of it. You saw one example uh, of what can happen under forced sales uh, back in October 19th, 1987, when you had so-called portfolio insurance. Well, now, portfolio insurance, and you ought to go back and read the literature for the couple years preceding that. I mean, this was something that came out of academia, and it was regarded as a great advance in financial theories and everything. It was a joke. It was a bunch of stop loss orders, which, you know, go back 150 years or something, except that they were done automatically and in large scale by institutions. And they were merchandised. People paid a lot of money to people to teach them how to put in a stop loss order. And what happened, of course, was that if you have a whole series of stop loss orders by very big institutions, you are pouring gasoline on, on fire. And when October 19th came along, you had a 22 percent shrink in the value of American business caused essentially by a doomsday machine. A dead hand was selling as each level got hit. And three weeks earlier, you know, people were proclaiming the, the beauty of this. Well, that is nothing compared — it was a formal arrangement to have these — this dynamic hedging or portfolio insurance. Uh, sell things. But you have the same thing existing when you have fund operators operating with billions and 
in aggregate trillions of dollars leveraged who will respond to the same s stimulus. They have, what it's, they have what we would call a crowded trade, but they don't know it. It's not a formal crowded trade. It's just that they're all ready to sell if a certain given signal or a certain given activity occurs. And when you get that coupled with extreme leverage, which derivatives allow, you will someday get a very, very chaotic situation. I have no idea when. I have no idea what the exogenous factor. I didn't know that shooting some archduke, you know, would start World War I, and I have no idea what will cause this kind of a thing. Uh, but it'll happen. Charlie? Yeah, and of course, the, the accounting being deficient enormously contributes to the risks. If you get paid enormous bonuses based on reporting profits that don't exist, you're going to keep doing whatever causes those phony profits to keep appearing on the books. And what makes that so difficult is that most of the accounting profession doesn't even recognize how stupidly it is behaving. And one of the people in charge of accounting standards said to me, well, this is better, this derivative accounting, because it's marked to market. And don't we want current information? And I said, yes, but if you mark to model and, and you create the models and your accountants trust your models and you can just report whatever profit you want as long as you keep expanding the positions bigger and bigger and bigger, the way human nature is, that will cause terrible results and terrible behavior. And this person said to me, well, you just don't understand accounting. If four years ago or whenever it was when we started to liquidate Genry's portfolio, we, we, had a, we had reserves set up for in the hundreds of millions and all sorts of things. And our auditor, and I emphasize any other of the big four auditors, absolutely would have attested to the fact that our stuff was marked to market. You know, I just wish I'd sold the portfolio to the auditors that day. <laughs> Maybe 400 million better off. Uh, so it, it's a real problem. Now, there's one thing that's that really quite interesting to me. You know, if, if I owe you on my dry cleaning bill or something, $15, and they're auditing the dry cleaners, they check with me and they find out that I owe you $15 and it's all fine. If they're auditing me, they find out that I owe the dry cleaner 15 bucks. There are only four big auditing firms, you know, basically in this country. And I will, and in, so in many cases, if they're auditing my sh side of the derivative transaction, you know, what I'm valuing it at, they, the same firm may often be value, valuing or attesting to the value of the, of the, mark by the person on the other side of the contract. I will guarantee you that if you add up the marks on both sides, they don't, they don't equate out to zero. We, we have 60-some contracts, you know, and I will bet that people are valuing them differently on the other side than we value them themselves, and it won't be to the disadvantage of the trader on the other side. Uh, I don't get paid based on how ours are valued, so I've got no reason to want to game the system. But there are people out on the other side that do have reasons to game the system. So if I'm valuing some contract at plus a million dollars for Berkshire, that contract on the other side is just one piece of paper. It should be valued at a minus one million by somebody else. But I think you probably have cases, and this is, I'm not talking about our auditors, I'm talking about all four of the firms. But they have many cases where they are attesting to values that of the exact same piece of paper where the numbers are widely different on both sides. Do you have any thoughts on that, Charlie? Well, I, as sure as God made little green apples, this is going to cause a lot of trouble in due course. As long as it keeps expanding and ballooning and so on and the convulsions are minor, it can just go on and on. But eventually, there will be... A big, a big uh, denouement.